Good morning, everyone. It is so nice to uh, see you. I can see you here on the chat. Uh, you can't see each other though. My name is Julia Berg and I am the Director of Education here at the Foss Waterway Seaport, which you can see behind me. So we are gonna get started here. Um, we have our very first virtual education program, Whale Bones Up Close and Personal. So please do bear with us. We're doing our best to learn how to do this. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about the Foss Waterway Seaport and what we do here. So we are a museum on the water in Tacoma, Washington. And we do a lot of different things here. We have docks, we're an amazing event space, we have a working boat shop, and we're also a education program. We do mostly marine science, um, but we also do outreach to our community and education programs within the museum. Of course, we're not able to do that right now. So uh, we are going online to try to bring our community some of our amazing programs that we've worked on over the years. So today we're gonna be talking about humpback whales. Uh, humpback whales, as some of you may know, now this program today is targeted for kids ages 6 to 10, so we're going to try to keep it at that level. If that's not the age that you are, that's totally fine, um, but just so you know, that is the way that we've designed the program today. This afternoon, we'll be running another program for ages 11 and up that's more targeted to older learners. So, humpback whales are a type of whale that you can find all over the world. They're absolutely amazing. They're a migratory species. They do all kinds of really neat things that if you're interested in whales, I encourage you to look up. And there's a lot of great resources to learn about the biology and what they do. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about a specific humpback whale that we have here at the Foss Waterway Seaport. So, Whales, humpback whales are endangered and they're protected by the Endangered Species Act. And that mean, means that whereas they used to be hunted and there weren't very many, now there's been a huge, we say resurgence, the humpback comeback. And last year, starting in 2019, if you were out on a boat in Puget Sound, it became all of a sudden fairly common, much more than it was before, to see humpback whales. Um, now, we have a humpback here in the museum that is, was a very young humpback, and she is very small. So, I'm going to tell you the story of her, and then I'm going to transfer you over to my colleague, Erin, who's going to actually take you up inside of our whale skeleton. So, this next picture is a little bit sad, but it's part of the story, so I do want to share it with you. So in, on Christmas in uh, 2015, we got word that a very small humpback whale, a yearling, which means just a year old, had washed up on a beach over in Gig Harbor. And this is very sad, but we did not want um, her death to go to waste. And so what happened is, a large group of people got together, including Cascadia Research Collective, scientists from the Mass Center. This was a large community undertaking to make something good happen out of something that had been kind of sad. So what they did is they took the whale and they buried the whale for six months until most of the meat was gone. And then they had the bones left. And Stadium High School right up the hill here, um, there was an after school program. And so some of the students from Stadium High got to come down here to the seaport and learn about whale biology and learn how to articulate the skeleton that you're gonna see in a few minutes, which means put it back together. So these are some photos from that time. This happened in 2016. So the whale was beached in 2015, right around Christmas time. So they had all these whale bones and they were still kind of dirty. So they had to clean them, as you can see here. And then they had to figure out how to put them back together, which is just a really huge puzzle. So here you can see some of the students. Erin's gonna show you this a little bit later, but because our whale was so young, the growth plates hadn't fused fully to the vertebra. So that was, they had to take all of these growth plates and figure out exactly which ones perfectly fit together. It was a huge puzzle and it took them a very long time. 
One really cool thing you're going to see about our whale is humpback whales are not toothed whales, okay? We have teeth, and some whales have teeth like orca, right? But humpback whales have baleen. And our whale, we were able to save the baleen and clean it and it's still on there. Erin will tell you a little bit more about that as well. So here's some more pictures of what the students did. So you can see these are the vertebra, which is part of the spine of the whale. You have vertebra too. If you take your hand and you reach behind your neck like I'm doing, you can feel those bumps. And those are actually your vertebra. So they assembled them and then they went over to our boat shop and they had to very carefully, perfectly right in the center and flat drill a two inch hole right in the center because then they assembled it here on the floor, matched up all the ribs and they were able to run a pole through the middle of it to hang it. So you can see this, I'm showing you this very quickly, but the process actually took a long time in real life. And then finally, they had her all assembled. They hooked up some cables, used our man lift, which you're gonna see in a minute, and everybody got together and were able to hang it from the trusses in our building, which are very special. And Aaron's gonna tell you more about that as well. So, um, I'm gonna now introduce you to Aaron, who is getting ready over here. Hi, Aaron. Hi, can you see me? <laughs> yes, I can see you and I can hear you too. Excellent. Okay, so like Julia said, I am gonna be going up into the man lift and my name is Aaron Wild. I am the program manager here at the Seaport, which means I do a whole bunch of stuff and one of those things is teaching. So that's what I'm doing today. And you've gotten a little bit of the backstory of our whale. And what I want to do first before I actually go uh, into the man lift is I want to give you a sense of how big she is from the floor. So I'm going to flip my camera around here. And as you can see on the left here, there's a little bit of a glare from the, from the light. So excuse that. There is the skull right over here on the left side. And then if we follow that all the way down, we eventually get to the tail, which is represented by a, a metal frame down there. So she, like Julia said, was about a year old when she was found. So she is about half the size she would have been if she was a full grown adult. So about 20 feet is how long she is. Um, and you can see the man lift here. So what I am gonna do is I'm gonna uh, set my phone down inside the man lift and then I'm gonna actually ride it up inside the rib cage and we'll go from there. And while I'm doing that, I'm gonna mute my mic and Julia is gonna take over if there's questions or she might give you a quiz question. So I'm gonna take the man lift up and I will see you in just a second. All right, thank you, Aaron. So I have typed in a chat, which you all should be able to see, where you can ask us questions. You can ask us questions about whales, questions about the Foss Waterway Seaport, and we will answer them for them. So right now, Aaron is going to be riding the lift up inside the whale, which is very exciting. I'm going to ask you a question, and if anybody knows the answer, you can type it. Uh, let's see, here's a question. We want to know how big mature adult males versus females get in humpbacks. Aaron, can you answer that? You're muted, Aaron. Your audio is still muted, Aaron. Okay, am I okay. on? Yep, go ahead. Okay, um, how big are females versus males? So it's actually interesting. A lot of the animal kingdom, we think that the males are bigger, right? Um, in whales, a lot of the time, the females are a little bit bigger. It's not a dramatic difference, um, but females tend to be, especially in humpbacks, maybe four or five feet longer than males. Um, so I know of a female humpback off of the East Coast who's about 51 feet, which is a very, very large humpback. And most of the um, adult males in that area are between like 40 and 45. So she's pretty big. Um, and that tends to hold true that the females are a little bit bigger. What else? Did we Julia, get, I know they did it, yes, thank you. I know they did a necropsy on the whale. Do you know, was there a cause of death ever determined? Um, for this whale, no, um, they didn't really determine the exact cause of death. She was a little bit skinny. 
um, but not enough to suggest that she had starved. So they think that maybe she got separated from her mom a little early and that can cause a lot of stress and disorientation. So they don't have an exact cause of death, but they think it was a combination of things. And there's another question from somebody that's asking, so why are they making a comeback in Puget Sound? And that's a really good question. Um, it partially has to do with the comeback of whales generally because they're not hunted as much anymore. Um, and also, a changing in migration patterns is what people believe that maybe the food that they're looking for isn't as plentiful other places so they are coming into Puget Sound. Um, this only really happened last year so there's a lot of current research being done on that and it would be a great thing um, to follow as to see if we have another migratory resurgence this year again. And keep asking those questions guys I will answer them um, in a minute. All right Aaron go ahead. Okay, so if you were watching my little video screen in the corner, you probably saw me get up into the lift. Right now, I am hanging out. Let me turn my camera around again. I'm hanging out inside the whale's rib cage, which I don't know how many of you have ever done that, but I will tell you it's pretty cool. Um, whales are mammals, just like us. What that means is they have uh, warm blood, they give live birth, and they breathe air. Okay, so I'm inside the rib cage, and we have rib cages too. Um, you can feel that on the side of your body, and that helps protect our lungs, and that's exactly what a whale's rib cage does. Um, they come to the surface to breathe air, and they use their lungs to get oxygen. So that's where I am right now, is inside the rib cage. Um, right above me here is the backbone, the spinal column, and some really cool things to show you in this area of the whale is a bunch of the hardware that is used. Uh, let me flip my chair. There's a lot of what we call eye bolts, which are these um, screws with a circle on the end. There's a lot of regular bolts. Oh, that's loose. Never mind. We're not going to touch that. Um, there's a metal bracing to help the rib cage stay in the right shape. There are these long metal poles that also provide some stability. And so there's a lot of hardware and nuts and bolts that go into holding this um, skeleton together. Um, Julia mentioned that there is a metal rod that goes through every single backbone in the whale and it's kind of threaded onto that pipe. And so you can see that right in the middle there. And they bent that pipe so that it looks like she's kind of swimming. It's a little bit more of a natural pose than maybe just straight all the way down. Um, what else do I want to show you? Oh, if you've noticed, there is writing on these bones. There's actually writing on every single bone in this skeleton. Some of them are a lot easier to find than others. So what that is, is the permit number. Um, to keep whale bones on display or for education, you have to have a permit from the government because um, whales are considered protected animals, and that also applies to other marine mammals like seals, um, dolphins, sea lions, those kinds of things. So that permit number says on this rib, CRC, which is Cascadia Research Collective, an amazing organization in uh, um, Olympia that does a lot of research, and then 1513 is the permit number, and then R10 means rib 10. Um, and that is indicating what, which bone this is and what number it is. So um, we've got permit numbers, we've got all this hardware, and we've got this giant rib cage that would have held some amazingly strong lungs. So I am gonna go ahead and move the lift again. I'm gonna put you in the corner so you can see. Um, and I'm gonna move on to the skull. So when you see me again, I will be up inside the whale's mouth. And I will turn it over to Julia while I do that. All right, so you guys are asking a lot of great questions, so thank you for that. Um, someone asked about the name of the whale, and she does have a name. So the students that put the whale together um, really thought a lot about this, and they wanted to give her a name that was very meaningful. So she's actually called Living Free is the name of the whale. So... Um, that was a very big decision for them. They all wrote opinion papers on what kind of whale, what kind of name you should give a creature like this. So they settled on living free. There's another question about um, 
migration and how far do they go. So different whale, let's call them families, um, come from different places and migrate to different areas. So the ones that we see around here, either a lot of times are going from Alaska down to Baja in Mexico, or possibly also from Hawaii as well. So different groups of humpback whales, they'll have a place where they go to feed, which is often Alaska or another place with, that's got cold water full of the things they eat, like krill, right? Um, and then they will, when they want to have their babies, they migrate somewhere else, like all the way down to Baja in Mexico or down to Hawaii into the nice warm water. You want to talk a little bit more about what happens with that, Erin? Um, I, I can um, I kind of want to talk about the the West Coast population, so the whales that live here um, in Puget Sound, they don't necessarily stay in Puget Sound all year, um, which we know because they migrate, um, but they will go all the way up to Alaska to feed, and then they will come down to Hawaii um, during the winter months to breed and have their calves, um, and it's a really incredible um, distance, physical distance, and amount of time that they spend migrating every year. It's really amazing. Great. So um, I know that Aaron's connection is glitching a little bit. Aaron, are you connected to the Wi-Fi? Uh, but we are <laughs> doing our best here to keep things going. So Aaron's going to double check that for a second. Yeah, you seem good now, Aaron. Um, okay. Another question. So um, from somebody who is in Alaska. Hi. Um, the male, the, the males, the whales come up to Alaska in the summer. That's when uh, they asked when they could look for them. So they come up to Alaska in the summer um, for feeding and then they are going to have their babies in the winter down in Mexico. All right. I know Aaron has lots of things to tell you. So go ahead, Aaron. Okay. So I am hanging out inside of the skull right now. So if I was a whale's body part, I would kind of be like the tongue, which is kind of gross to think about. But right in front of me and to the right and to the left are these two bones. And I'll put my hand on it so you can get some scale. Um, these are what's called the mandible. So this is the lower jaw. And then there's the other one over here. So I'm sitting right where the tongue would be, and then right above me, this bone right here is called the maxilla, and that is the upper jaw bone. And this really weird and kind of nasty looking broom stuff, this is baleen, which Julia mentioned earlier. So baleen is kind of like teeth. Um, a lot of our larger whales have baleen in their mouth instead of teeth. If you were a whale that had teeth, you would have something more like this. Um, so this is a replica of an orca tooth and so the main difference is that whales with teeth like this will grab their prey um, maybe shake it a little bit to stun it but usually they just swallow it whole they don't do much chewing um, if you have baleen you're also not really doing any chewing but what you are doing is taking in a whole bunch of water and then pushing it through these plates there's actually little spaces in between that it's very hard to see when it's all packed in um, and those small spaces are very, very good at catching food, such as plankton, um, krill, and even small fish. So these whales do eat fish. They don't always eat just plankton, um, but their baleen is um, specifically for that purpose, to filter food out of the water. Um, again, we have a bunch of hardware holding these things together. So there's these two giant eye bolts that hold the lower jawbone up onto the actual skull, which is right here. Um, and then two other things I really wanted to show you back here in the skull. Um, I'm kind of a little bit higher up than I thought I was. I'm trying not to bump my head on some rib bones here. Um, this is the first thing I want to show you. So there's two of these bones right here and right here. Those are the ear bones. Um, whales have extraordinarily good hearing. Um, they don't really have ear flaps on the outside like we do. But what they do have are these giant ear bones that help them carry sound into their brain. And there's my hand for scale. It's about the size of a fist. And these are called bulla. Okay, so a whale's ear bones are called bulla. Don't ask me why. I have no idea. Um, one other thing I want to show you is that these whales, like we talked about in the beginning, 
um, they get buried on the beach to decompose, which means to break down. And they also um, get buried in what's called compost or manure after that. And so it takes a lot of cleaning to get these skeletons um, museum ready. And sometimes there are things that get missed. So I was up here practicing the other day and I found some dirt that's been up here since 2016. So they missed just a little bit of dirt from the compost, which I think is really funny. So that is the skull. So like I said, there's the ear bones. And as we look forward, there is the top jaw, the baleen, and then the bottom jaw. So if I was a whale body part right now, I would be right where the tongue is. And... Erin, can I you explain a little bit about the trusses? There's some questions about how we have a whale hanging from our ceiling. Yeah. Um, so we have, uh, the seaport is a warehouse or was a warehouse. Um, and it was built by the Northern Pacific Railroad Company. And the truss system on the roof, which I'm kind of trying to see while also being inside of the whale, um, these are railroad trusses, bridge trusses. And they are incredibly strong. And the difference between a railroad bridge truss and a normal truss is that the V in the center, right there, points like a normal V instead of, instead of like this. Um, so these are incredibly strong and I can show you a little bit of how this is attached up here. So we have a lot of cables, a lot of wiring that holds this, this whale in place. And Julia, if you wanna take over, I'm gonna move the lift again. Okay, so thank you for that, Erin. And I wanted to say a little bit about social distancing. So our museum is closed to the public. Um, we only have essential personnel working here, which is just a few of us. And we are, I am about 100 feet from Erin right now in a different area of the museum. Um, so I just want to remind everybody at home to be safe and be careful and stay home if you can. Um, Aaron is moving the lift into a different position. So I'm going to ask a, let's see if we have some more questions over here. How are the bones held together in a live whale where the boats, bolts are now? So that's just, um, the same way that it is for us. So with cartilage and muscle and tissue, um, is the same way that we hold our bones together is the way that the whale would have held their bones together. And of course that all would have been covered by, um, well, in a whale's case, blubber, and in our case, skin. Let's see some other questions. What does the whale eat? So this um, is not a toothed whale, right? It's a whale with baleen. So the whale basically, the baleen is kind of like a like a strainer. If you've ever uh, eaten spaghetti and you cook the spaghetti in the water and then when it's done, you don't want to eat all that water. You just want the spaghetti. It's exactly like what a whale does. So the whale opens up their mouth. A uh, bunch of water goes in and hopefully some food, some krill, which are kind of small shrimp-like sort of creatures and smaller fish or kind of what's ever around while the whale is swimming. Uh, and then they get this huge mouth and throat full of water and food. And then they have to strain it out just like you do with your spaghetti. So using their tongue, you know, mm, and if I was a whale, all the water would be coming out right here and all of the food would get caught in my baleen. I don't actually have any baleen, unfortunately, because that would be a very convenient way to eat my spaghetti. Looks like Aaron is ready to tell us some more stuff. Aaron, you're muted. Okay, should be unmuted. Um, I'm going to do this the best I can. I only have two hands, <laughs> and I'm on a very um, shaky lift. Um, but what I want to show you up here is I have moved um, outside of the skull. And I am standing right in front of these little bones out here, and they're held together by, it's not quite wire, it's not quite cable, it's just a, a little metal rod. Um, what these bones are, are the flippers. So whales have two flippers on either side of their body. They're kind of like our arms in a way that you might not expect. So let's see if I can do this. I do have, don't be alarmed. Not real, but I do have a human arm here. 
so I want you to bear with me for just a second. Oh, I have a um, laser pointer that I want to point out some of the features of a human arm versus a whale. So on our human arm down here, I've got my laser pointer. That flat bone is our shoulder blade. And then this long one is called the humerus. That's in the top of your arm. So if you're following along at home, you can kind of um, pat between your elbow and your shoulder, and that is your humerus. There's your elbow joint right there. And then there are two bones in your forearm. So if you've ever broken your arm, you might already know this. Um, there are two bones inside of there, the radius and the ulna. There's wrist bones, and then there's finger bones out here. So in the whale skeleton, I'll point those th same things out, the exact same bone. So up here is the shoulder blade. Right there is the humerus. This is the radius and ulna, so that's like our forearm between your elbow and your wrist, Julia is showing you. And then there are all these little tiny guys down here, and these are finger bones. Um, and it may be a little confusing to think about a whale having fingers. Um, they don't wiggle like we do. Um, you can't really see them, but they do have those bones left in their flippers um, when they are alive. And these are some of these are very, very small. So let me show you this one up here. Um, it's about the size of my finger, ironically. And so you have to be very careful when you're putting these skeletons together because you can lose a lot of these bones pretty easily in the dirt or on the beach. Um, and two, some other really cool things I want to show you are these. If you go down the line, you can see these kind of sticking out from the finger bones. Those are barnacles that had grown on the outside of the whale slipper and they actually scraped them off and saved them. Um, I'm not really sure why barnacles tend to grow on what's called the leading edge of the flipper, so the front edge of the flipper, but you do see them a lot. And so the kids that put this whale together saved them, which I think is really, really cool. Okay, and one other thing I wanted to show you, which I think I will um, also bring back in just a second is this little guy. So we have these, these big vertebrae, the backbone up here in the whale skeleton, and then compare that to this one, which is from a porpoise. So porpoises are maybe the size of the, of the humpback whale's jawbone, um, so you can imagine how much smaller their bones are, but there's a very similar bone structure between small whales and large whales, which is why I wanted to show you this little, this little vertebrae right here. And I'm going to move on to my last part of the skeleton, which is towards the back. And while I'm doing that, I will pass it over to Julia. All right. Thank you, Aaron. So lots of questions coming in. Um, one in the Q&A, which I'm going to answer live, which is why do whales breach? So um, whales breach for lots of reasons. Mostly we think it's to communicate. Um, communicate in general. Um, humpback whales in particular do a really cool behavior called bubble net feeding, which I've actually seen in Alaska. And I highly recommend that you Google that and look at some of the videos. It's basically humpback whales all come together and they have a feeding behavior where they sort of they call it bubble net. It's not really a net made of bubbles, but I don't want to spoil it for you. Look it up. But during that behavior, they end up all coming up out of the water and some kind of breach in a different way. Um, but we also do see them breaching. And, you know, we don't completely know why um, they do that, but we suspect it's for communication. Um, somebody, Quinn, wants to know why there are holes in the barnacle. So, I think that you're, it sort of looks like a circle with a hole in it, right? So the barnacle, a barnacle is an animal and it's alive, um, but that barnacle is not alive anymore. So after, they can survive out of water for a while, um, but that one is gone. So when you have a dead barnacle, all that's left behind is its outer, let's call it a shell. And so where there would have been a little animal in the middle, little barnacle, that's gone now. So the hole in the middle is where the barnacle used to live. Looks like Aaron is ready. Aaron, you are still muted. Okay, so I'm kind of back in the center of the skeleton here, so I'm a little bit um, towards the end of the rib cage, which is behind me. And then if I flip around, there are three things that I want to show you very quickly. The first are these two bones right here. 
that are kind of hanging down from the vertebrae on these little cables. And when the whale is alive, these bones were not actually connected inside to anything. They're what's called free floating bones, which is pretty cool. What these are is millions and millions of years ago, whales used to live on land and they had four legs. And as they slowly got more and more um, comfortable in the water and started living there more often, their, their legs shrank um, in evolution. So now, millions of years later, they have these bones hanging out in their body, and that is what used to be their pelvis. Um, so not all whales still have these. There's a really fancy term for body parts like these that don't really have a purpose anymore, and that's called a vestigial structure. So um, something similar in humans. Um, what's a vestigial structure in us, Julia? Can you think of one? I think Julia's muted or, or lagging. Uh, there we go. Um, a tailbone. Yeah. Um, our tailbone, sometimes people call our appendix a vestigial structure because we don't really need it to live. Um, but that's what that means. And so Julia is screen sharing what that looks like um, in a live whale with this drawing. Um, and sometimes you will find these bones when you're cleaning a skeleton and sometimes you won't. They're pretty fragile, just like the finger bones. Um, the second thing I wanna show you real quick, which we talked about, was um, on each of the vertebrae, there are these little caps on the end, on both sides. Those are called bone blebs, and they're like growth plates. So we mentioned this was a very young whale, so she was still growing and getting bigger, and these little free-floating plates allowed her bones to expand. Um, and Kids' growth plates are kind of the same way, where they're not fused yet. So each of these bone blebs or growth plates only fits to one vertebrae. Um, so they had to find them, match them to the right um, vertebra, and then glue them on. So it was a really, really long process to find all of those. And then the very last thing I want to show you, which is a little bit hard to see from here, is the tail. Um, so the whale's tail does not have any bones in it. Their flippers do, but their tail does not. And another um, word for the tail is the fluke. And if you are following along and you kind of grab your nose, um, hold on, grab your <laughs> nose, wiggle it around, or your ears and fold them over, um, that is cartilage. And the whale's tail is also made of cartilage. And so the students, um, to represent that, since they didn't have any bones to show you where the tail was, they made a metal frame. That was the size, accurate size, and they put it on the end so that they could see the tail. And I think we'll do one last kind of tour down the backbone. There's the skull and all that hardware holding it together. Erin, I'm going to read you a couple of questions. Um, okay. Why do all, why do the bones all have tiny holes like a sponge? That's a great question. Um, I. I know the answer intellectually, but I don't want to give any false information. Um, human bones, if you look at a cross section of our bones, also have holes in them. Most things with bones have these little like, let me see if I can find an example, kind of like these, like pits. Um, your bones aren't exactly like rock solid. There is kind of like a lattice work inside of it that's, that's built of, of calcium. And so you'll get little pockets and divots inside of your bones. Um, because of the calcium structure. I'm um, not sure if that's what we were asking, but if you do look at the human bone, you'll find very similar things. I think that's a great answer. Um, how long can a humpback whale stay underwater without coming up for air? So they normally, the dives are pretty short, um, you know, six to 15 minutes, but they can stay underwater up to 45 minutes um, on a deep, deep dive. And a group of whales is called a pod. And the bone, wouldn't the bone rot away after being buried? Um, bone is pretty strong. I suppose eventually, yes, or, but it would have taken a very, very long time. Um, it's common practice when you want to mount a skeleton like this to let nature take care of getting rid of the more stuff that's going to break down or compost faster, leaving you with cleaner bones. Um, so burying it is a good way to go. 
see. Yeah. Um, I wanted to make a quick comment. So yes, a group of whales is called a pod. Um, generally, that applies to whales that have teeth. Um, so orcas, dolphins, and things like that tend to travel in groups or family groups. Um, whales with baleen, like this humpback or grays um, or blue whales, they tend to be a little bit more solitary. Um, they don't really travel in family groups. Occasionally, they'll come together to hunt um, or to breed or to socialize, but they don't tend to live in groups, to live in pods together. Right, um, and that's why the bubble net feeding behavior I was talking about is so cool, because if you've ever been to Alaska, or I see there's some of you that live there, um, it's pretty common up there in the summer to see a humpback, but you really just usually see one, and maybe, you know, it sees you, and you see the tail, and goodbye, but if you're lucky enough to see bubble net feeding, that's something that you will not forget, so look up a video of that, you'll love it. Um, Aaron, do you want to show them the fin whale skull? Can you see it from up there, just for a size comparison? Yeah, um, so we have another um, marine mammal artifact here. That's a fin whale skull. And so there's the ribs. And then there is the skull. So to give you some scale on that, that skull is the same length as this entire skeleton. Um, here, I'll walk over there for a second. Oh, perfect. I won't be able to hear you though. So you'll see Julia come into frame in just a second to show you how big this, this skull is. It's pretty impressive. There she is. So Julia is about, I don't know, five, six. She's got some heels on right now. She's going to lay down and show you. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so we've considered doing a shorter version of this kind of virtual programming with the thin whale skull because there's a lot of details that you can um, really get up close to with a camera um, that I think would be really cool to show off. So if you'd be interested in looking at the fin whale skull in a different program, please let us know. All right, well, thank you everyone for all of these amazing questions. Um, Let's see, how many whales are in Puget Sound? Um, there's lots of different types of whales. We have our orca resident pods. We have the orca transient pods. We see minke whales, humpback whales, um, you know, porpoises. Harbor porpoise. Right, dolphins, um, an exact number. I'm not sure anybody knows that, but there are lots of different types. Um, and Ethan wants to know, how fast do humpback whales swim? Ooh, that's a good question. Aaron, do you know that? I have to look that um, up. I don't know exactly. They're not, you know, they're not known for being very quick. Um, I'm sure they can do bursts of speed. If I had to guess, I'd say they can maybe like do a 15 mile an hour sprint, but don't quote me on that because I do not know how fast they can get or what their average speed is. But I know from um, working on a whale watching boat that focused on humpbacks that they're not super quick, but they can be if they're in a hurry. Um, I cheated and used Google, and it says about 5 to 15 kilometers an hour. So if you don't know what a kilometer an hour is, there's another thing that you can look up. All right, guys, we are way over on our time, so I want to end this um, to make sure that in case someone else has another online class that they would like to attend. But we will be back at 1 o'clock doing this same program again, um, targeted at older learners um, and adults. So. If you know anybody that you want to send a link to, we'd be happy to uh, see you there. Anything else, Erin? Um, yeah, if you have young kids that we're watching, we are going to put together um, a very brief um, activity packet that has to do with both this whale in, in particular and some general like anatomy and, you know, word searches and things like that. So if you're looking for things um, for kids to keep busy, we will have that available for download on our website um, very soon, probably by the end of the day. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for coming. And uh, you can watch our website for a schedule of what we're going to be doing each week. Um, of course, we are kind of limited right now as to where we can go and uh, what we can do. But we're doing our best to bring you some engaging content using the museum and all the science equipment that we have since we know that you can't come to us right now. So have a wonderful are we in the afternoon? Nope. Have a wonderful morning. <laughs> and uh, maybe we'll see some of you this afternoon. Bye. Thank you.